Uh, good evening and welcome to the March 20th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, I'm Chris Hellman. I'm vice chair. Um, I'm going to be sitting in for Brian Adams tonight, who's got a medical issue. Um, hopefully he'll be able to join us, um, but I'll be handling the gavel tonight. Um, before we get started, uh, this is an opportunity for general public comment on issues, CPC issues not related to tonight's agenda. So if there's anybody who'd like to share their feelings on what's going on here at the CPC, this is your opportunity. Do I see any hands? Just shout out. No? Okay. Um, I guess we have some minutes to approve. Do I ask for a motion first or just comment? Uh, motion first and then... Okay. So can, okay. I, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of November 3rd? Thank you, Julia. Second? And second. And Kevin, thank you. Um, any comments on the, on the minutes? Okay. Um, Sarah, you want to take us through? Yes. Roll call needed since we're remote. Uh, Jeff? Yes. Julia? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Lemmy? Yes. Martha? Uh, Chris Tate? Yes. And Chris Hellman? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Chair's report. Uh, I don't really have anything other than um, Martha and Sarah and I were able to attend the site visit yesterday at uh, Memorial Hall. Um, <clears throat> I won't spend any time on that now, but I think um, we all have comments that uh, will be useful when we um, when we begin deliberation on that. And uh, Sarah, thank you for setting that up. Um, financial overview. You got anything for us? Uh, nothing to update. At, at this okay. Point. All right. Um, so before we uh, tonight, we'll be hearing the second group of applicants for um, uh, grant funding on, in the spring round. Um, last week, we heard from uh, Woodland Drive Housing, uh, Pioneer Valley. Um, affordable housing monitoring program, invasive species control from Lathrop, and uh, historic Northampton's proposals for the Parsons and Shepherd houses. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Memorial Hall Restoration, that'll be Central Services, uh, the Main Street Park design from Cities Planning and Sustainability, um, agro agricultural preservation restriction programs from Planning and Sustainability, um, Ryan Road uh, uh, Playground and the Crafts Avenue Housing from Valley CDC. Um, before we do, um, I just want to um, uh, tell our presenters just quickly, uh, where did I put my numbers? Here we go. Um, we're looking at a total of um, nine uh, program applications this round. Um, we have going in $774,000 uh, in available grant money. Um, the requests in this this spring version of the round total 3.68 million. Um, that includes the Memorial Hall project at 2.7 million, which um, by accounting from people with more experience even than I, uh, that's the largest single proposal uh, that's come before the CPC. Um, and, uh, but even absent that program, um, uh, the total requests for this spring are 967000 uh, which is more than we have available uh, by almost $200,000, which means uh, we're going to be having to make some, some difficult choices as we move forward. Um, so um, with that said, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, we'll go through them uh, in the order that they appear on the agenda, which means uh, I think we'll be hearing from... Um, Central Services, Pat McCarthy, and uh, uh, see here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Pat. Hi. Thanks for yesterday, and thank you. You uh, got the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, good evening, CPC members. Uh, I want to thank Mark, Martha, and Chris for coming out and spending the time yesterday, doing a and Sarah doing a thorough uh, walkthrough of Memorial Hall. 
Um, uh, just to give you an overview of our um, department, as you know from our application last fall, the Central Services Department oversees grounds, maintenance, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, security, fire detection, and protection. Sorry, detect fire. So, I'm sorry, fire detection and protection, custodial services, renovations, and construction operations, and capital projects for city and school buildings. Approximately 26 plus buildings. Central Services maintains approx approximately 792,000 square feet of facilities, which includes City Hall, uh, the Municipal Building, Memorial Hall, the Police Station, the Main Fire and Florence Fire Stations, the Senior Center, James House, and the Academy of Music, and six schools in the Northampton Public School District and Department of Public Works facilities. Central Services operates the municipal mail delivery program, manages the city and school facilities office and custodial supplies, helps solicit and secure natural gas and electricity supply contracts for municipal and school facility operations. Central Services also maintains and um, Central Services also oversees maintenance and capital projects for the EJ Gare Garage, the Gothic Street parking structure, and multiple city parking lots, and coordinates maintenance and upgrades for the city streetlight system, which includes approximately 3,000 streetlights. Um, last fall, Central Services submitted two CPA applications for historic exterior repairs at both City Hall and the Academy of Music. We did not receive CPA funding for either project last round, but were urged to return and resubmit another application this round for City Hall. However, because of more urgent concerns in the Memorial Hall building, we have submitted the substantial funding request that is before you this evening. Just for your information, the City Hall is expected to receive $485,000, a half million dollars of capital, city capital funding to carry out two of the seven phases of the City Hall exterior repairs. Additionally, the city recently appropriated another $426,000 in stabilization funds for immediate emergency repairs at Memorial Hall. This year, not including what other city departments are re receiving, Central Services is expected to receive another $1.9 million in city capital money for other necessary um, annual city and school facility repairs and upgrades. Despite similar annual allocation in previous years, this year's total capital allocation to Central Services alone potentially is 2,390,000 after uh, city, city council approval. As noted in the, this uh, Memorial Hall application, Central, Central Services proactive, proactively hired Gale Architects in the spring of uh, 2023 to conduct a building envelope evaluation of study, uh, evaluation study of Memorial Hall. Central Services received the completed Memorial Hall building envelope study from Gale in November of 2023. This study has been shared with you as part of this application. In, in January of 2024, approximately four feet of heavy historic plaster crown molding fell a few feet from a staff person's desk in Veterans Department located in Memorial Hall. This is the approximate weight of five bricks falling about 15 feet to the ground. Someone could have been seriously hurt. Fortunately, no one was. This, is, this incident is one small symptom of a larger structural issue that is being caused by the building's poor water and moisture management systems. It has taken several decades to get to this point. It is for, this, it is for these reasons that Central Services has applied for the uh, Memorial Hall funding rather than resubmitting the application for City Hall. Although we are moving ahead with the design and the immediate structural repairs at Memorial Hall, the 426,000 recently allocated by the city will not address the remaining needed historical repairs 
or the existing building water management system problems that are creating all these problems. There is still more to do. Due to time concerns, I realize there are many details I've omitted in the history of this city building that brought us here tonight. I hope after our short presentation, we will be able to discuss your questions previously given to us, as well as any additional questions you might have. Right now, I would like to introduce Mark Loringer. He is the lead architect from Gale Architects. When we began studying the building envelopes for the Academy of Music and City Hall last spring, the two architectural firms we, return, we routinely work with recommended we contact Gale Architects for Memorial Hall. They are a leader in their field of historic engineering and restoration of buildings similar to Memorial Hall. They are presently the historic consultant for the $14 million historic restoration of the Chicopee City Hall. I'd like to welcome Mark Loringer. Can someone give Mark the ability to share his screen? I look forward to your questions after Mark's presentation. Thank you. And uh, Mark, you should be good to go. Let's share. Thanks, Pat. Time. Yes, I think I am. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Beautiful. And can you see the screen? Yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, yeah, thanks, Pat, for that introduction. I think you've um, summed it up quite well. I'll go into a little more detail here um, about really the, the holistic scope of the necessary masonry facade and structural stabilization repairs for Memori Memorial Hall. Uh, again, I am Mark Loringer, Senior Associate and Partner with Gale Associates. Uh, I've been with Gale since um, 1999, so 25 years. If you're unfamiliar with Gale, we are staffed with uh, professional engineers, architects, planners, and athletic facilities specialists. Not that that applies here. Uh, we've been in business for 60 years. You can ignore that 59 years there. We are privately owned, and we have seven offices across uh, the East Coast. I'm located here in Connecticut, but our headquarters is up in now in Rockland, Massachusetts. So we have good proximity uh, to Northampton. One second, slides are not changing. All right, here we go. Um, some of our disciplines that apply to this project are the building enclosure, design and consulting, uh, structural engineering, of course, and a little bit of civil engineering when we get into talking about the roof stormwater management around the building and some of the site stormwater management around the building. If you're not familiar with the term of building enclosure, uh, that really is the, the roof, the facades, any weatherproofing that keeps the inside environment in and the outside environment out. Uh, we are specialists in forensic evaluations related to premature failures or long-term failures. Uh, in the case of Memorial Hall, that's an ongoing issue as Pat alluded to. Um, again, we do specialize in moisture and air intrusion troubleshooting. Um, in this case, moisture being the most uh, prevalent item we need to look at, um, and then historic preservation uh, of building enclosures and historic structures as well. Um, the previous photo that we showed you is a pretty standard parapet wall. You can see that there is a crack uh, that runs through that parapet wall, but this was really due to continued water infiltration uncontrolled that went unaddressed for decades, truly. Um, when we got onto this roof, we could put our hands on top of the coping caps and actually move that parapet. It was debonded from the structural system below. And I'll show you this structural system below, that long-term water infiltration had deteriorated the embedded steel, in fact, jacking that entire top portion of the building up in the air. So this is really just to reinforce the effects that water can have on such a mass masonry uh, building with, um, with or without 
some <laughs> embedded steel components within it. Uh, so again, the, the services that we provide, um, emergency structural evaluations, structural augmentation design, um, and gravity load analysis really do come into play here for Northampton. So that's me, that's Gail Associates. And now um, we can talk a little bit about the scope items at Northampton. Um, Pat really did touch on the project background, uh, numerous reports of water infiltration. We did do our study, provided that study in 2023, and we determined a number of emergency situations, uh, whether they be fall hazards or structural stabilization that were required at the time. But our evaluation really did also focus on the holistic facade restoration. So what I wanna show here is just some of the areas where we have some uncontrolled uh, roof stormwater drainage coming over the roof edges and spreading uh, through the masonry facades. This is on the west elevation on the south return um, where we have some combined leaders, some leaky gutters um, and some masonry all coming together in that one location. You'll see on the plan down here, that's really the extent in plan view of what we're showing on this elevation and where we've seen the moisture deterioration at this spot here. Really full height um, from roof eave all the way down to grade. So that was one of the, one of the um, worst case areas here. Um, some other illustrations on the building, some other photographs of the building. Um, this is adjacent to the front entrance. These are the sandstone um, foundation plinths that rise from grade up before you get to the red brick masonry veneers uh, or facade, I should say. Um, and what's happening here is we just have continued water getting into that masonry assembly. But once it gets in, it also wants to come out. And when it comes out, it's pulling minerals out of those sandstone blocks resulting in that erosion that we see here. So this obviously does not happen overnight, um, but it takes some time to occur. So that's just another location. There's other similar um, deterioration and erosion on other portions of the building adjacent to the entrance, as well as down the west side, east side, and south sides of the building. Another image, this is actually on the east elevation at the south return, very similar to what we have occurring at the west elevation, just not as severe. But you can see at the bottom of the wall, the uncontrolled water that's coming off of uh, the roof area above, not being controlled properly, cascading over the masonry, creating some of that same uh, erosion of the sandstone blocks. You can even see a little bit of efflorescence up here in the brick masonry, telling us that we have water in the masonry that's trying to get, that is getting back out of the wall and leaving those salt deposits on the surface of the building. So we know we have water inside this wall. Uh, even down the bottom of this wall, this is really just directly below the photo before, uh, we can see the granite blocks also have some levels of erosion in them as well. Not as bad as the sandstone, uh, the sandstone being a softer material, um, less dense material than granite, but we are seeing in some of the granite components as well. So we go from just masonry deficiencies up to roof and masonry deficiencies, where we have the intersection of the roof of the masonry on the south return at the west elevation. Um, when we got up there to do our eval, we did remove some bricks so as to see the condition of those backup withes and how these stones and bricks were attached to the backup withes. We wanted to understand that general condition of what we have there. So when we go back with a repair, it would be at the appropriate depth and type. So we need to solve the situation where we have water coming off the roof, water coming in through the in through the facade. Um, Cause I think as you know, uh, mortar joints, especially open mortar joints and brick masonry is porous. It will absorb and take on moisture. 
and we have to get it back out of the mall. So what we're working on um, as part of the emergency repair uh, design, we obviously go from a conceptual sketch to um, CAD sketches, but the concept here is to create a through masonry flashing that picks up water within the exterior veneer, uh, exterior facade, exterior wythe of brick, and brings it back out to the outside, drains the wall um, better than it is now. In fact, it's really not draining now, it's going into the building in many cases. So from concept to design, obviously to implementation during construction. Um, and I mentioned a couple of times, there's a, a confluence of um, gutters, downspouts, all coming into one location, overloading the drainage capacity of that gutter system. So part of the emergency and, and permanent, permanent long-term repairs to correct uh, roof stormwater drainage is to reroute, potentially resize these downspouts so they're not uh, providing an overflowing condition, an uncontrolled condition. So some of the other effects of um, moisture, water, liquid water, vapor, not vapor, but um, liquid water on masonry. Um, we see it even in your entrance stairs, the granite stairs going up uh, to that main entrance. We have some large mortar joints either indicating some settling of those uh, probably stone stringers and granite treads below or perhaps heaving uh, of these treads above the lower level. Um, in Memorial's case, it's not terrible. We've seen worse. Uh, in this condition, we actually had a two inch displacement of various treads. So um, looking to get the stringers repaired underneath these stairs, get these reset, weatherproofed for a much longer um, fix for these front entrance stairs. Um, again, masonry deterioration. This again is at that south return of the west elevation. Uh, and you can see the displacement of those two sandstone elements in relation to the ones that remain in their original position. And that's all due to that water getting in here, the deterioration of the masonry, the attachment, uh, and the freeze thaw cycling. Uh, pushing that masonry out of the wall and bulging the masonry below it. This was one of the worst cases we saw on the building. Um, and we've seen this picture before, but this is on the east elevation. And what, what, what I wanted to point out here, not only the erosion in the stone, but you can see some uh, cracking in the what was once mortar joints in the vertical uh, coins here, the sandstone coins. Um, they've been repaired with sealant, which is not something we're going to recommend uh, or provide in the design, but what you can really see here is a lateral displacement to the left of these stones, again, due to that water in the wall and the, and the freeze-thaw deterioration and the displacement of those stones. Um, you can even see a spall here at the base of one of those stones as this, as this stone uh, moved to the left. It broke off that corner. Um, so this side, not east side, not as bad as the west side, but if left uncontrolled, uh, it will get there over time. As I mentioned, um, getting to the interior, uh, you do have water getting into the interior. And as Pat mentioned, um, that plaster can become detached from the masonry, detached from the wood or metal lath, resulting in a fall hazard. So there's a few locations where we have water coming into Memorial Hall documented in our report. Um, but what does happen, it just goes from a, you know, a, a leak. This is a pretty bad leak down here on the lower left, but it goes from that condition to eventually this condition where the small plaster keys, <clears throat> excuse me, that were once forced into the slats of the lath deteriorate. And the plaster can become debonded from that support system. When we get down into the basement um, and talk about structural deficiencies, there are a number of masonry arches uh, that exist in the basement. 
Um, and through different mechanisms, whether it's flooding or rising damp coming from the floor upward, um, just due to moist soils, slabs, uh, in that basement, we have a lot of deterioration of brick arches, as well as at the base of the arches. Um, you can see all the brick dust, mortar dust on the ground. Um, but if you're not familiar with that rising damp term, um, that is the porous, the absorptive masonry pulling moisture out of the soils and bringing it up uh, the masonry walls via capillary action. So there's a few different locations where we have that. Some of these here obviously being uh, the worst case scenarios. When we look at the um, exterior foundation wall, uh, this is very typical here of what we're seeing here for down the west elevation, down the east elevation, you have a um, kind of a mixed granite, other various stone foundation kind of cobbled together with mortar joints. Um, and I just want to highlight here that this type of building, although large, super heavy, um, very thick in its wall sections, does move um, just through thermal cycling, through ground movements. They're made with soft mortar and they're allowed to move. But sometimes when you have too much water, you get some large cracks through those foundation stones or a displacement between foundation stones um, laterally in the, in the face of the wall. So we are seeing that in certain locations um, here at Memorial Hall. Um, at some point, uh, there had been some steel pipe columns installed in the basement with a beam on top supporting the uh, floor joist ends that sit um, up in this brick masonry portion of your foundation. And due to uh, the flooding that is present in this basement at times, those lily columns uh, have deteriorated to a point where they really require replacement. So we're looking at a design to replace those with new footings um, on properly engineered subgrades. So looking at all those deficiencies, looking at um, what is wrong and where the water's coming from, we can look at the roof and masonry restoration and repair. And we talked about through the wall flashings, uh, roof rain leader um, reconfiguration and uh, partial, partial replacement of worn rain leaders and gutters where necessary, perhaps rearrangement, reconfiguration of those throughout the rest of the building as well. Um, and what I'm showing on the right are just some images of what that might look like when the job is in progress doing a through wall flashing. This is a single wide through wall flashing. Um, here we did another single wide through wall flashing with some copper step flashing, which is essentially based off that detail that you saw earlier. And of course, new gutters, conductor boxes, leaders. This is on a project in uh, Middlebury, Connecticut. They were having similar issues to Memorial Hall. Um, this is actually, the lower left photo is actually very, very similar to what we have going on on Memorial. Gutter end butts into masonry. Uh, roof is coming down, joining that location. Luckily, this project had an overhang just above it, so it was shielded from a lot of the moisture, and we didn't have the moisture, uh, the masonry defects that we have at um, Memorial Hall, but a very similar condition. Um, and then this is just an image of some flat lock copper roofing going into a gutter with some nice straps and covers there, which would be implemented uh, into the copper ice belt that you have on the back of house uh, roof area right now. And when we get to structural stabilization, uh, we talked about the arches downstairs and there is a schematic design out, um, not on the street, but in circulation uh, with, with Pat, with me. Um, where we intend to reinforce those existing arches, essentially take out those brick arches um, and get something much more permanent into uh, those locations, um, as well as, I think I mentioned, uh, replacement pipe column and footing and footings. Um, so I just wanted to show a few um, items here of masonry restoration. Here we're stitching some step some vertical step cracks together 
with a helical tie, a stainless steel helical tie, which gets pointed in afterwards. There would be some of these repairs on Memorial Hall. There's some two Y3 building at a very large parapet at a building in Boston. This was actually just going on a couple of days ago. Um, and then we have a couple images here of Chicopee City Hall where there's individual stone replacements that we would anticipate for portions of the Memorial Hall facade too. This being a very similar sandstone in, in um, material and color to what we would have in Memorial Hall. You can see this little sample here we use to match up that sandstone um, in this instance. Of course, none of that is gonna work if we don't fix, um, none of those masonry repairs are gonna last if we don't fix the roof stormwater and then the foundation drainage issue that we have um, on the east and west elevations. Um, currently, it's my understanding that the below grade leaders that run from our existing roof leaders towards the south and an existing catch basin um, no longer function. We get backups, not only at the top, but water coming in through the foundation because it's chart, the water is charging the ground and coming in the foundation instead of being drained away from the building. So the, the concept here is to excavate this area, get down to basement slab level, repair um, the foundation as necessary, waterproof it, as you can kind of see in the lower left corner. This is on new construction, but it'd be a similar process uh, with some sort of uh, perhaps a fluid applied membrane or a sheet applied membrane. Um, and then get that foundation, get that roof drainage system, stormwater drainage system working, get all the water away from the building to slow any deterioration of this um, old masonry structure. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, anyone with questions? Yes, Martha. Oh, I hit the wrong. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> okay. I can see. No, I do have a question. I just hit the wrong icon. Um, Mark, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Really, really thank clear. You. And um, the illustrations were great. Um, I have two questions. Um, when I was on the site visit yesterday, and I noticed on the east elevation between the building and the Unitarian Church, which is next door. Um, the, you know, the grading there, that pavement, a lot of, there's a lot of water coming towards the uh, Memorial Hall uh, building. And I'm just wondering if that, um, you factored any of that into the design of what you're doing, or does that have to all kind of be, you know, regraded? Um, and then there's another building, um, which we're gonna be talking about later tonight, that's gonna be, you know, proposed to be built not too far away. I think that is also connected to that whole stormwater system in there. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts were about that. So yes, I failed to mention on that last slide, the last bullet was slope, um, slope the grade away from the building once we refill it back in. Um, a little bit perhaps easier on the west elevation where we can have the park coming in and our building going out to a, a swale or a, a kind of like a little trench coming down back for surface water. Mm -hmm. um, might be a little more difficult with the traffic and uh, the parking on the east side, but there would be a portion, whatever we excavate and put back, um, we would want that sloped, the surface sloped away from the building. But that would definitely be a coordination effort with what you have going on in that drive area and parking area. Um, and I would say our estimate um, our scope really only included to the limits of that excavation to get to the foundation, drainage, and waterproofing. Okay. Yeah, I just, it, it looks, I mean, it does look like the, the grade is slipping away from the building now, but only for a very short distance, and the rest of the water is just charging in from the Unitarian Church. So 
um, I guess this, I would say to the city, to Patrick, I guess you might want to, we talked about that yesterday. You might want to give that a little, some, a little thought, more thought. And then my second question, um, in terms of um, actually executing this project, um, is it going, is the hiring of a Mason contractor going to be done through a bid process? Is it um, municipal bidding, um, you know, lowest qualified? And are you as architect or engineer, excuse me, um, going to be uh, providing CA services during the process? Cause this is such, a, you know, it requires a lot of expertise. I guess that's what I'm worried about the city's money, you know, making sure it's um, being apportioned to a person that knows what they're doing. So I'll, I'll answer the last part of that, um, maybe a little bit in the front, but Pat, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, yes, at that value, it would be publicly bid. Yes. Um, and our proposal to Pat right now does have design, bid, and CA services included in it. Right. And filed, filed sub-bids? Um, absolutely would have filed sub-bids for masonry, sheet metal, um, probably miscellaneous metals. Um, that's just off the top of my head there. Right. I'm following chapter 149. Correct. So, yes, Mark. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Kevin. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mark, can you comment on when you're doing your historic preservation, how close to history do you have to adhere uh, as opposed to modern methods and, and materials that might not have uh, you know, the, the same vulnerabilities that uh, things did a century or so ago? So this building um, obviously has old school materials in it, sandstone, granite, brick. Um, don't know exactly what the mortar consists of right now, if it's a natural cement. Um, I don't think based on the age of the building, it's a Portland cement mix. So we would steer away from that Portland cement mix and look at natural cements or lime uh, based, more lime based cements uh, or putties perhaps. Um, so that's kind of from a, a material standpoint. Um, I don't think we would deviate from that. Um, Pat, are we in a historic zone here? Is this on the National Register, if you can remind me? I don't think it's on them. It is in a historic district. District, right. I'm, I'm not so, sure if it's on the register. Yeah. Right. So passing this through mass historic or any local historic committees, obviously, we're going to keep the brick. We're going to keep the brownstone. We're going to keep the granite. Uh, anything we're doing above flashing wise is going to be made out of copper. There's already copper on the building. Um, there's not going to be a lot of modern materials put into the masonry restoration that that is visible. Um, obviously, for anchors, we're going to look at galvanized steel, uh, hot, to, hot dipped galvanized or stainless. Um, for anything underground waterproofing wise that you're not going to see, um, those would be more modern. Uh, but not something that, you know, a historic um, preservation committee or, uh, you know, person is going to be too worried about. Um, you know, we're trying to improve the performance of the of the building. And if that's what we need to use, then that's what we're going to use. And that's what we're going to bury in the ground. To follow up on that, would there be uh, ways to prevent a recurrence of this to the extent that in many cases, you're gonna be using the same traditional materials that have gotten into trouble now. Uh, is there ways to extend the life of those given what we know now that wasn't perhaps known when the building was built? Well, I think it all comes down to um, long-term maintenance and noting that there's a problem and solving the problem um, as efficiently as you can. Um, obviously, this building is uh, mid to late 1800s, and it's taken that long to get into the condition that it is. But our designs generally are going to give you a, another 50 years, 40, 50 years um, before you need to provide any substantial repairs or replacements. But it really, you know, the length of these products, these materials, 
do depend on proper installation, proper flashings, water control, um, and identifying regular maintenance as as it comes up. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands here. No? All right. Um, Mark, Patrick, thank you. Um, just a reminder, our next meeting will be on the, what do I got here? 3rd of April. Um, that'll be for public comment. Um, so anybody who um, wants to come in and speak on behalf of the uh, the proposal um, or raise any concerns, that'll be an opportunity to do that. Um, and once again, thanks. And um, moving on. Uh, Thank you. Next Thank week. you, Mark. Have a good day. Good yeah. night. Thanks. Good night. Uh, and you're welcome, of course, to stay for the rest of the presentations, but uh, there are no penalties if you don't. So, <laughs> uh, bye now. Okay. thanks. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, the Main Street Park design. And um, Carolyn, are you here? Yes, I'm here. How are you doing? Good. You have the floor. Great. Um, so I just have, I don't have as many um, pictures as, um, for the main street, but I'm just going to share my screen a little bit here. We just, I'm, I'm going to go through the first, um, one, um, first up is the main street park design. And, um, this is a request for, this is sort of, a, this is adjacent and sort of part of the, um, whole redesign of main street or the picture main street project. Um, but, it's not the design components are because this is a park and the, the location is right in front of um, first churches at the corner of center and um, main street. So it's a, sort of in this upper diagram here um, where it says first churches arts plaza. And so there are two buildings in this block that um, go from center street to Gothic. Uh, we've got the first churches and then the, former bank or now urban outfitters building. And um, this is a designated public park. Um, we have joint um, maintenance and um, responsibilities with um, First Churches. There's an, there's an agreement with First Churches um, regarding this. And so we've had, we've been in um, contact with them about this, but the idea is that we're moving the curb line as part of the Picture Main Street project further in towards the street. And it's uh, opening up an opportunity. Not only are we going to be um, replacing the sidewalk in this location, but also moving the curb. It gives an opportunity to sort of think about the elements of this park and, and make it um, a more, um, in, enhance it, as a way to create another sort of downtown pocket park that um, is a little bit further away from Pulaski Park, is sort of midway down the Main Street corridor, and sort of rethink the way um, this might invite more people um, to the space. The arts, um, the arts um, <clears throat> committee, um, our arts and culture department. It has um, long been um, planning to remove what's referred to as the art kiosk here with that um, um, semicircle bench area in that area. And so we know that's coming out. So um, we think that this is an opportunity to sort of rethink that and redesign it with um, you know, support and assistance from the church in terms of their feedback. They certainly view this space as a gathering space, a place where um, you know, a, a separate little sort of convening and and um, celebratory space. And so we want to look at how to protect the trees that are there, uh, as well as create more opportunities for different types of, um, you know, functionality. So um, we have a cost estimate from our design team who's, who is working with us on the Main Street project to look at um, sort of rethinking the space. We're asking for $77,000, which would get us through the 75% design um, portion. Um, and we know that it's about $89,000 all told 
to get through to PSE, so projects um, of plans and specifications. So, um, so it's about um, the ask is about then um, you know. 80 percent of the total cost of this park. Um, so we're looking at conceptually, we've looked at new seating, better tree protection, potentially a water feature. Um, one of the things we've talked about um, in the city is making better access for um, people who might not be able to seek out water sources or pools to cool down when it's really hot and we want to create an inviting space in downtown potentially where anyone and everyone can come and and enjoy downtown but also get some relief from that heat so that's another thing that we're sort of thinking of which is just conceptually a little picture in the lower left corner of what that might be it would be very small but um, just create something fun and different um, and but also practical um, in terms of providing that um, benefit so you know, nothing's been designed. We just had the concept here, but this, that's the, um, the reason for the ask. And um, uh, that's approximately what the costs and values are. All right. Um, any questions from, from the committee? Yes, Martha. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, I just had a couple of questions about um, uh, the approach to design. Um, I'm wondering if there was or will be a public engagement process involved in coming up with a final design, or maybe that was done as part of the Picture Main Street progress, or you felt like you sort of um, accomplished that already, you know, where the butter is involved. Um, what, what, talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, we've had a little bit was part of the, the ongoing conversation about sort of the type, like the palette, the colors, the textures, the types of, um, seating features that, that might be included, um, generally already through the picture main street project. This is more the fine tuning piece. So this was always sort of considered um, to be one of those additional plaza spaces um, as, as we've gone through the Picture Main Street project. Um, but as we're um, thinking about it in more detail, um, we um, have engaged the, um, the pastor at First Church, um, and we've um, communicated also with um, the owners of the Urban Outfitters building. Um, so we're in those conversations now. I mean, the, the church is really excited about the opportunity. Um, they This space is very important to them in terms of what programming they have and um, the opportunities it brought provides for um, the public to convene here for protest, for celebration, for, um, you know, service. And so um, they're, um, they've, you know, I've, we've been in communication with them about the importance of that and making sure that we continue, that that that's, continues to be a component of anything that we're looking at. And so in terms of like the broader public, uh, I mean, you know, will the design be up on the city website or there, are there any public forums scheduled? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, extent. we haven't scheduled, we don't have any scheduled public forums about this piece. Again, sort of the concepts were identified, have been identified through this whole process. But as we're getting down to the details, I um, do imagine that we have another um, point of engagement for this particular location, um, but we haven't scheduled that yet um, because we haven't we haven't had the opportunity to really sort of step aside and just take apart these little components. So another one is in front of City Hall, and also. Um, We've had a little bit more engagement across the street at that corner, on the opposite corner of Center Street, um, but this one we haven't. So I anticipate, I anticipate we'd either go through either a general uh, um, conversation or through 
um, stakeholder groups, you know, the DNA um, chamber and, um, or, and other um, committees. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah, hi, Kara. Um, the, uh, the curb you mentioned is gonna get moved by how much? How much, how, how much um, depth is going to be gained? So it will be um, uh, about um, 15 to 20 feet in this location. Minimally 15 feet. 15 feet of, uh, of additional uh, space or 15 feet total from the steps of the church? Um, so if you think about, um, so I guess maybe both in that sense, in that the curb is going to come out into the street about 15 feet. And that means, um, there'll be some space for that separated bike lane, but then the sidewalk will also be moved a little bit. Um, so we'll sort of maybe add about 15 feet of, well, potentially, more plaza space. It kind of depends when we get in there and okay. um, really look at the details of exactly where those lines are. And we're pretty okay. close to identifying that, but we're still in the process. Thank you. All set, Kevin? Chris Tate. I think this is a similar question. Hi, Carolyn. Um, Hi. I'm just wondering kind of the box that defines the first church's arts plaza. Does that include the retaining wall and kind of the raised lawn area in front of the church? It's within that um, box. And we're talking about what's kind of outside of that retaining wall? Yes, it'll be outside the retaining wall. So we're not gonna touch that piece, um, that retaining wall. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this? All right, Carolyn, you're you're up again. Okay. Thanks. Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. Okay, so um, so this is a request to fund a local agricultural preservation restriction program. Um, if we did this a, several years ago, a long time ago, I guess I would say, just sort of temporarily as as a one off. Um, but what an APR program is. Um, it allows, it essentially buys the development rights from farmland, um, which then essentially assists farmers in either reinvesting in their farms or um, providing, you know, retirement or whatever funds, um, but then permanently protects that land to be in agriculture. So it's a, it's a tool to permanently protect um, ag lands in the city. Um, our requested budget is $60,000 to support this. Um, it might, we might have a total cost of um, $85,000 to provide to a local um, farmer who's interested in permanently protecting land. Um, but it is, um, it's, and, and I have this map up here to show what other private farms are permanently protected through agricultural preservation through, throughout the city. It's not a lot, but it, this map also doesn't include all the other land that's protected. This is just the extraction of ones where we purchased the development rights on the farmland um, in order to permanently maintain those um, parcels in agricultural production. Um, and so what this program could do is um, essentially supports this, what we already have as a state and federal APR programs, but for to be eligible for those programs, you have to have at least five acres of land. You have to show that you've been pr production in active agriculture for the two preceding tax years. Um, you've produced $500 in gross sales for the first five acres plus additional um, um, sales for um, those remaining acres. And so um, 
and and that program works with uh, matching its federal dollars and state dollars, and then that requires a local match. Um, and sometimes CPA funds have been used to to provide that local match, but there are cases where um, farmers or farm parcels don't qualify for that minimum acreage, or maybe they they haven't had the gross gross proceeds. So this, um, a local program could um, also provide opportunities for people to permanently protect their land if they don't qualify for those state minimum thresholds. It also provides a little bit more flexibility or, or quite a bit of flexibility um, to expedite the process for permanent protection um, because, you know, if we do it locally, um, it's just faster than going through the state and federal um, APR program process. So um, the, um, there, there might still be, you know, these, what we wanna protect are those um, farms that have, um, you know, high yield soils um, and um, will be permanently used at, um, in agriculture. And so that's what the ask is about. Any other questions on this? No? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Again, April 3rd is our next uh, meeting, and um, you're welcome to bring in whoever you like. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, up next we have the uh, Ryan Road School Playground for All, and I see uh, Sarah and Andrea here. Um, I'm not sure who wants to start. Um, I'll start. Um, I'm just going to, my on cue, the dehumidifier turned on, so I'm just going to turn it off <laughs> in case it's blocking the sound. There we go. Um, so I'm Sarah Haugen. I'm the physical therapist for the Northampton Public Schools. Um, and I have with me today, Andrea Agito, who is a, one of our loved kindergarten teachers at Ryan Road School. Um, and I also have Samantha with us, um, an occupational therapist um, in our area who works at Foley Dickinson Rehab. Um, so I'll do the primary presentation, but both of you can feel free to interject um, or add to anything I'm saying um, at any point. Um, and I think I'm just gonna, share my screen right to start off. Um, oh. hmm. Do I need to get permission to share my screen? Uh, you should be all set. I sh okay. Try that again. For some reason, it's not letting me share my screen. Andrea, are you able to open up the presentation? I will give it a try. We have lots of great pictures in here to show you. I'm not sure why it's telling me that um, my settings isn't allowing me to do this. Hmm. Does it make sense um, for us to work on this and for someone else to present next? Or do yeah. You and you, Sarah, if it's a small enough file, you could email it to me or share via Google Drive and I can throw it up on the screen. Okay. I can share it with, I can share the whole slideshow with you. Um, yeah, I can click through the slides if, if I can, okay. if you can send it to me. I just sent it to you. 
Um, Laura and or Megan, do you want to jump in while we get this straightened out? Uh, I'm happy to. I have my slides up. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. So moving on to uh, Crafts Avenue Housing. And William, you're up. Okay. Let me know when you can see it. We're there. Excellent. So I'm Bill Womeldorf. I'm a project manager with Valley CDC. I am joined here with Laura Baker, uh, our development director. Uh, Valley is an established nonprofit with our roots in Northampton. Our mission is to provide uh, and build social equity by expanding housing and small business opportunities. And what we're talking about today is 27 Crafts Ave. Um, but before I jump into the project, I just want to talk about the location. So Crafts Ave is off of Main Street. Uh, it's a very walkable part of downtown with access to services and amenities. Uh, it's adjacent to the uh, well-traveled bike path uh, shown on the screen. Uh, it also provides access to uh, a local bus station transit for both uh, local and regional transportation, uh, which provides residents uh, in that area with a choice of mobility. Um, I'm going to zoom in on, on the specific site that we'll talk about. Uh, it's shown here on the screen. And then these little um, kind of yellow rods kind of really show you know, what, what the site is. Um, cause a lot of people when they hear this site are, are kind of confused where it actually is. Uh, it is at the, uh, the parking lot on the lower side by the annex building, the staircase and retaining wall, and a little piece of uh, the parking lot on the upper lot of Crafts Ave. Uh, this is a parcel that was owned by the city, uh, and city council ordered surplus land for affordable housing. Um, this is particularly because uh, the city was identifying good candidates for affordable housing, and this site lend itself really well due to the uh, choice mobility that I talked about earlier, but also because the retaining wall was shown to be failing and would need to be either replaced or uh, reworked. So the city did approve that uh, RFP, uh, which went out in November 2022, and Valley's proposal was, was selected, and, and since uh, May of 2023, we've, we've owned this parcel, uh, shown in yellow. Uh, the RFP came with some strict requirements. Uh, first off is a high level of energy efficiency, uh, meaning that the design must meet passive house standards, uh, and cannot use fossil fuels, which is a part of the Northampton, uh, requirements. Uh, it also is that the developer must use uh, or must provide a majority of extremely low income housing. So these are 30% AMI uh, with a preference for uh, folks who are currently unhoused. Uh, and if that parcel isn't built on within five years, uh, it would have to revert back to the city uh, or at least show progress towards that. So the project uh, started with a lot of community outreach uh, where we actually uh, just uh, had the architect and uh, worked with local residents and trying to kind of take surveys of people with lived experience living in uh, studio housing, uh, either coming from homelessness or uh, at extremely low income levels, um, and to kind of really help inform the design of Crafts Ave. Uh, we met with Director Butters uh, to address any concerns that they had regarding uh, the building going on. Um, and also presented to a variety of other key stakeholders, such as the Historic Commission, uh, the DNA, and um, uh, the Local Housing Partnership. Uh, some key benefits were, were identified with this project. Um, some of them are, you know, that we are actually, uh, by the nature of the, the, using the LIHTC credits, uh, we do form a, uh, an entity that does pay property taxes. So, you know, we are increasing uh, revenue to the city, which otherwise wasn't there. Uh, we're providing affordable housing, which is a key goal of the city. Uh, we're providing that affordable housing to be one energy efficient uh, in the sense that it's, it's a meeting the, the carbon goals of the city as well, but also per, uh, increasing um, uh, business traffic downtown by, uh, you know, folks who are going to be, you know, kind of walking through to amenities, but also um, uh, people who may want to work at uh, nearby, um, you know, businesses 
you know, either doing minimal wage jobs or things that uh, necessarily uh, where residents may be priced out of living in a downtown environment and, and have difficulties getting in and out of the city uh, without a vehicular uh, means of transportation. So what are we thinking here? We're, we're thinking 30 total apartments with 20 of them being at extremely low income levels. Uh, those levels are shown on the right hand side in orange uh, for individual households. Uh, 10 apartments are gonna be at the 60% AMI uh, threshold, uh, which we're gonna call kind of a more moderate income uh, approach where you know somebody could be you know working kind of a minimal wage um, earner. Uh, we're thinking all studios and uh, with five of them being fully accessible and the remainder being visitable uh, or, or you know, generally uh, a high degree of accessibility just by the nature of the elevator that we'll provide. Uh, and we'll have some special population set aside for uh, clients of the DMH program. So we'll talk about massing on the site of 27 crafts. Uh, we really adhered this to the uh, uh, central business side street district, uh, which we wanted to meet uh, zoning as of right without needing a, a 40B comprehensive permit. Uh, so this is how we kind of arrived at the, the form. It was really designed to read as, a, as two buildings, a four story building uh, up against a five story building, uh, meeting the, the heights and dimensional requirements uh, as of right for the zoning district. Uh, some of the material choices include brick and other uh, areas that are um, uh, help kind of uh, welcome it into the historic fabric of the downtown. Uh, here's some of the renders, uh, courtesy of uh, JWA, uh, our Joan Witsit Architects. Uh, they're a very talented firm up in Greenfield. Uh, one of the key goals of this was to uh, careful attention to the overall height of the building so it does not exceed the, uh, uh, the turrets of City Hall. Uh, so you can kind of see that on the bottom right hand uh, image, which is from Main Street looking towards crafts. Uh, you can see the building in the in the background uh, and then kind of zooming in on that on the top right. Uh, the, the main image on the left hand side of the screen is actually from uh, Old South Street as you're kind of uh, pulling off of from crafts, uh, looking to the left towards the Roundhouse Plaza and provisions to the right. Uh, talking about the site plan, uh, there's going to be no loss of permanent parking along crafts, uh, which is which is great. Uh, city employees do get shuffled around as as there is a loss to the uh, the bottom parking lot and then two spots on the upper lot, uh, which are are being addressed in in other locations. Uh, we'll, we'll have a per, um, a shared dumpster with the the annex building, um, courtesy of Central Services. And uh, we'll be providing uh, emergency uh, pull-off for vehicles on Roundhouse Plaza, which is shown kind of over here on the screen, if you can see my cursor. Uh, we'll be also providing a new accessible entrance. And the EV charging station will move up on the site towards crafts, uh, towards, um, towards City Hall. Uh, so here's some of the floor plans, but don't you worry, we'll, we will zoom into some of the key sections here in a second. Uh, just so you can kind of see the overall form of the building and, and kind of how the, the studios uh, take up the, the space on the upper floors. Uh, the ground floor won't have any uh, apartments, but will be uh, not leasable commercial space, but rather um, uh, amenities and offices servicing the, uh, the residential use. Hmm. Uh, here are some of the, the two kind of studio types. We have a, an accessible studio on the right and then a, a, a kind of typical studio to the left. Uh, these are what we call enhanced studios. So they do have, they're equipped with a full kitchen, uh, bathroom. Uh, they have kind of a, a designated area for dining, living, and 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 sleeping. They're, they're really uh, uh, great for uh, you know, really great studios versus kind of what was done in the past, which is more kind of uh, SRO type housing. Uh, we've had great experience on it with other projects with this particular size um, of, of of studio. Uh, ground floor, I'll, I'll zoom in here and, and uh, tell you kind of what, what we're thinking. Um, we'll have a on-site property management staff uh, in one of the offices, and then we'll have some level of resident service coordination. Uh, so, you know, services for uh, the residents and then an additional office space. Uh, there'll be bike storage, one for each resident. 
uh, and then we'll have this uh, kind of day room uh, community space in the in the front of the ground floor. Um, we'll also, because there's not much site work to, to uh, work with on the site, uh, we'll have a roof deck on the uh, the fifth floor, which will uh, double as additional community space for residents. Uh, the timeline. So what's in orange is completed. We we did uh, secure our zoning permit in August. Uh, and right now we're, we're developing about a 70% uh, design development plan set uh, and going in for the spring round. Uh, the spring round is important for us because we do have two other funding rounds coming up late summer and early fall. Uh, this is with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston. And then we have a, um, with the, the state's executive office of housing livable communities, we have a, um, a supportive service round uh, in September. So it's important to show uh, support from the, from the local, uh, particularly financial support into the project. And uh, we think our request is gonna help uh, increase the competitiveness of our application in, in a really highly competitive environment with the state. Um, and we do plan to go in with the fall for kind of the remainder of our requests and then go into a, a January funding round in, in uh, early 2025 for the remainder of the funding of the project. Uh, so here's our CPA request. Um, it, like I said, it was really geared towards uh, gearing us up for these upcoming state uh, funding rounds that, that are gonna be crucial to the success of the project. Um, we understand that CPA resources are are limited this round and and uh, adjusted our ass accordingly. Uh, we're looking forward to this project. It, it really is something that we think that the city and uh, has worked well with us and and we're really excited to um, you know pull off the design. I, I think it's going to be a great uh, landmark property here on on Crafts Ave. So uh, I appreciate the committee members' time and uh, I'm happy to open up to uh, questions. And before I do that, I, I do want to uh, just see if Laura Baker has anything that she wants to uh, share on the project as well. Yeah, my comment is I hope they don't send any of that stormwater from Memorial Hall down our way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just would, part joking and part serious is, you know, we will be paying a lot of attention with a building like this that's kind of bunkered into a hill area to make sure that we have adequate drainage systems that will carry water away from the ground floor of this property. Uh, the ground floor won't house anybody, but we still want it to be dry. And that has not been true at Memorial Hall. It has not been true at the annex building. Um, so that is something we're very mindful of. Um, I think we tried to lay out pretty um, clearly in our application kind of why we're asking for the amount of money that we're asking for now from the CPC, because obviously you have many more requests before you than you can fund um, and it's all about kind of timing um, so we're looking for kind of a smaller allocation now and then hoping to come back in fall for the kind of larger chunk of local money that we would hope to raise for the project um, that's all I have thanks Laura yep uh, I'll open up to the questions of the committee members Bill can you take that screen off yes yes yeah. Questions, anyone? Uh, Lemmy? Yeah, hi. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, I was just curious how you landed with like the architect and the um, the other the two companies you mentioned. Like, what was your selection process? What's like accountability to those folks? Like that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me. So, uh, we actually, um, the city actually started the architecture, particularly the community engagement aspect, uh, before Valley was selected as the developer. Uh, so part of the the RFP was actually um, uh, utilizing that design uh, with the, with the city. Um, so the city did secure uh, some state funding for the architecture and engineering, and uh, uh, JWA selected uh, Stevens and Associates as the site designer who's actually working on that annex building. Uh, we think there's a benefit of having the same site designer in all these um, kind of locations here to, to really make sure we understand the, the drainage and, and these issues kind of from a, a global or neighborhood-wide perspective. 
I would add the city started exploring this site for the resiliency hub. That's kind of why it was identified and why Jones Witsit was called in to kind of, they were working with the city on really doing stakeholder input for the hub. Um, in the end, it was, it, the site just wasn't, didn't seem large enough to really accommodate um, the hub. And so, but it was identified. And so it became available for an affordable housing use. Uh, Martha and then Jeff. Thank you. Um, yes, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Laura, to answer your question about the drain, <laughs> drainage uh, around um, Memorial Hall, I, I do think that whole situation back there is going to have to get looked at um, because they just, the city doesn't know where the water from that um, is going. The pipes are all clogged and they can't even be scoped. So um, it's a big, it's a potentially a kind of a major issue. Um, the, the only question I had, and I think it's probably implied, uh, but I didn't see it in the proposal. These are, there are permanent, um, these are permanent affordab affordability uh, units yes. in per perpetuity, okay. Yes, so the city typically requires a 99 year or in perpetuity um, affordability restriction. And also these are, permanent in the sense of being permanent supportive housing, meaning nobody has time limited in terms of how long they can live there. Mm -hmm. um, and we do know there is a broken storm water pipe behind City Hall in that parking area. So we would be excavating in that area and hoping to correct that existing problem as part of this project. Good to know. <laughs> Jeff. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, one of the general questions this committee has for uh, projects of this size that we could have asked um, at, with other presentations and, and in the previous session was, uh, I appreciate the movement down from 800,000 to 200,000, but is there a is there a rock bottom amount um, to make this project go um, forward to trigger those additional funds that you alluded to? Um, and yeah, I think I think that's a, the basic uh, question that, that I have looking at this. Um, and we are very short of funds this particular round. And yes. is there is there is there any part of this that could be further postponed? down the road or is 200,000 right now kind of like the rock bottom amount. Okay. Do you want me to answer that bill? Do you Laura, want to... I'll leave it up to you. Yeah. So I would suggest that 100,000 um, certainly could be considered. I think you go below that and it starts to look a little like a token amount um, given the size of Northampton and its prior commitments to affordable housing. But no, there's no magic number. We're trying to balance what looks like a reasonable contribution from the locality with the awareness of how limited funds are right now and the timing of these upcoming applications. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Anybody else with questions? No? Okay, well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, Sarah, are we, do we think we're in good shape on um, Ryan Road? Yes, we should be good to okay. go. Okay, why don't you? All right, we're gonna take two. <laughs> Sarah. All right, so um, this is our uh, presentation on our request to build a, um, a playground for all in Northampton. Um, and we would like to um, house this playground at our Ryan Road Elementary School. A um, couple of reasons that we think Ryan Road would be the ideal location um, we, is, is that Ryan Road already houses um, a, a variety of recreational ac activities. Um, so it is the site where a lot of youth athletic programs happen, our Northampton Youth Football, um, Northampton Little League, we have the League Legends basketball courts that are already there. Um, and then the catalyst for, um, for movement on this 
was finding out that the current um, play structure at Ryan Road was going to need to come down um, in the near future because it's no longer meeting codes, um, safety codes. So we found that we had an opportunity to um, rehabilitate an existing recreational facility that also exists in open space and the beautiful um, fields and woods surrounding. Um, and um, we decided to apply for um, CPA funding. You can hit the next slide. Um, so our vision is really to create not only an accessible playground, um, but an inclusive playground. And there's a lot of discussion um, about the difference between the two. And while accessibility um, really focuses on ensuring um, mobility throughout a playground space, um, primarily looking at wheelchair access, um, Inclusivity goes beyond that and looks at making sure that we have a playground space that not only allows for physical access, but is also um, providing opportunities for a variety of learners and children that have um, different needs, as well as their caregivers and family members in our community. Um, we're looking at um, the principles of universal design. so. We're looking at diverse populations of children and families, making sure that they all have access to health, um, wellness, creativity, and um, social context to participate within their community. Um, this seems to be a big need in our city. Um, and as a physical therapist, I spend a lot of time on playgrounds. Um, and most of my days outside with children at all four of our elementary schools um, and the children I spend time with are children that have um, a variety of physical limitations, cognitive, sensory needs, um, social, emotional needs. And um, these are children that are oftentimes left out of play opportunities on playgrounds and our playgrounds just simply do not provide opportunity, um, equal opportunity for these kids. Um, so the design that we came up with um, will not only benefit all children with a variety of needs, um, but it also will help benefit our teachers, our community caregivers um, who have mobility and access needs by allowing them to be present within the spaces that their children are. Um, and it also, we're also looking at um, enriching our community by updating um, the landscape of our, one of our educational spaces um, for our children in our schools and also um, our community members, the larger community. Um, the next slide. Um, and this is our playground design, um, which I we've spoken um, about changing some of our design components. Um, but basically, we split this into a two phase project. Um, and it doesn't really matter which phase is done first, phase one or phase two. Um, it should be noted that we will we would be able to save about fifty thousand um, dollars in the total cost by doing the whole thing at once, um, which is a a significant chunk of money. Um, and the reason for that is because splitting um, a project like this into two phases, we really um, you're looking at mobilizing equipment twice. Um, you're doing demo and removal of old structures twice. Um, and so by doing this all in one shot, you are saving some money. Um, but that being said, we realized that the our, our asking $500,000 and $250,000 um, <clears throat> is a lot of money at once. So we, we were able to split the playground in half. Um, Everything from the midline to the left would be a phase one, which encompasses a large 
the largest part of the playground where we have a ramped structure um, and some inclusive pieces of equipment that we're gonna go through in more detail. And then the second, the middle line to the right um, has um, a more affordable or more affordable side to the playground. You can go to the next slide. Um, the playground company that we felt strongly about using is Landscape Structures. Um, they are really a leader in creating inclusive playground designs. Um, this is something the company is known for, um, and they have done extensive research. Um, and they have a lot of experience, and they're um, they're they're uh, committed to doing evidence based best practice playground designs. Um, O'Brien and Sons is the local consultant of landscape structures. Um, and we um, have had a really great experience collaborating with them so far. Um, and they've been really able to capture our design, um, a design that reflects our vision. Next slide. Um, so some of the, uh, the key components that our design is addressing. The first is accessible ground surfacing. Um, and our next slide is gonna go more detail into more detail about this. Um, we're looking at having accessible entry points and transfer points and ramped pathways throughout our, play, our playground. Um, we're looking at having a combination of elevated and ground level play components. Um, which are equally important in an inclusive play setting. Um, rich sensory opportunities that include movement, sound, color, and tactile experiences. A wide range of variability um, to support developmentally appropriate play. Um, so we were really careful about making sure that um, kindergarten age through fifth grade um, would be able to have developmentally appropriate um, physical play opportunities. Um, we also looked at seating options for rest, access to shade, um, and then places for gathering for communal eating like tables and benches. Um, and then we also added um, something that I think is really um, unique and state-of-the-art, um, a built-in communication board that supports our children who have um, used multimodal forms of communication to communicate. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, we can start to look more closely at, um, at these components. So accessible and sustainable ground surfacing is really the foundation of um, accessibility and, and inclusivity in the playground. Um, so these pictures are showing what <clears throat> this rub, uh, rubberized ground, pour in place rubber surfacing looks like. Um, it is smooth, um, it drains water. Um, it is, it doesn't ever really need to be repaired pat until about seven to 10 years out. Um, it does not need to be refilled like um, wood chips would or um, loose particle rubber. Um, and what's really the most important feature of this surface is that um, it has shock absorption. So it is considered a safe playground surface, but it also provides access for wheeled devices. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is further supported by the Architectural Access Board um, of Massachusetts and their stance on ground surfacing um, in playgrounds. Um, and this is the group that en enhances and enforces the regulations um, for public buildings to be accessible. Um, so section 521 in the um, Code of Massachusetts regulations um, identify that um, in order for a playground to be accessible, it needs to have accessible routes to the playground, and then it needs to have accessible routes within the playground to any and all play equipment. Um, and so they specifically state that loose fill surfaces and aggregate surfaces, including wood fiber, bark mulch, and wood chips, 
and shredded rubber um, are not accessible routes for, um, for the playground. Um, and I can attest to this because I spend so much time with students who use wheelchairs um, on playground surfaces that it is incredibly difficult to push a wheelchair through shredded rubber um, and bark mulch surfaces. And it's even more difficult for some a wheelchair user to propel themselves through um, this kind of surfacing. Um, so that is something that we felt was really, really important to our plan and something that we um, is really um, the basis of what we're looking at for accessibility in our playground. Next slide. Um, another really important feature of our play structure is having ramped pathways. Um, so there is no point of the play structure that you can't be on um, in a wheelchair or a walker. Um, this is something that's really important um, because oftentimes there might be a ramp onto a play structure, but then from there, there's steps and level changes um, throughout the rest of the play structure that don't allow you to move through it. So our play structure is accessible from entry point to access act to exit point. Um, so the <clears throat> the play structure would allow a child in a wheelchair to be anywhere on the structure at any time. Um, the next slide. Um, obviously, it's really important that our um, structure also has, has um, a variety of um, challenges. So we not only do we want to provide an opportunity for a variety of learners with different needs, we also want to attract all of our peer partners and all of the children um, that don't have restrictions in how they play. So we have climbing surfaces that include slides and ladders, rope webs and hanging bars that come off of different components of the play structure that also challenge various skill levels of different children. Next slide. Um, something else that we have included in our design structure were ground panels or panels that can be added onto the structure that increase sensory opportunities. Um, so some of these are color wheels. Um, there is a very cool rain sound um, wheel that you can spin. There's lots of different musical instruments um, or musical panels that, that can be added in um, and areas that allow for um, pretend and imaginary play. Next slide. Um, these are, this is uh, featuring two of the inclusive pieces, really inclusive play equipment. Um, the one on the left is called a Wii saw. Um, this is kind of like a, a, a seesaw effect, um, but it has much more support. Um, it has a higher high back support for children that have difficulty maintaining upright postures, um, who have differences in muscle tone and muscle strength. Um, so it provides foot support and back support and hand support um, for children who need um, more, more supportive seating um, and there's also a variety of ways to use it um, to challenge different types of learners. Um, on the right, there is the We Go Round, which is one of the coolest merry-go-rounds I've ever seen. Um, there is a video clip if you if we want to watch um, a little bit of how this works. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a merry-go-round that is built into the surface, um, and so you there's no getting um, on or off of it. You're just going in and out. Um, it's movable from the inside as well as the outside. And Sarah, if you want to click on um, the link, it should go right to. Um, right. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, it's okay. <laughs> Sometimes YouTube gets a little funky on screen share, but okay. let's see. Oh, geez. Can you see the screen or no? 
Mm -mm. Okay. No, okay. we still see the slide. And if it doesn't work uh, now that you all, you have access to the slideshow, you, you could certainly watch it too. Um, <laughs> oh, there we go. <clears throat> um, so this can be moved again, like from the outside, from the inside, um, there's a wheel that you can turn to move it. Um, there is just, there are no, there's no barrier to this piece of equipment and it's something that all children can do together. Uh, which is really special. <clears throat> now we can go to the next slide when you're back. We get to roll Hold on, on this thing, technical turn around, how do I make this thing uh, and we get to <laughs> and choosing where we want to go and how we want to use it. Um, it's pretty easy to pop this things up. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we also included um, sound and music opportunities in our playground design. Um, this is something that can be really important um, for children. Well, for children in general, music is so important and it's something that connects us all and it's something that attracts multiple age groups. Um, we wanted our playground to be something that um, parents and grandparents and caregivers um, felt eager to join in the in into play with their kids. Um, and this is, it's also a really um, important component for many children with learning differences um, or children who have um, visual impairments, um, sound is really important. So we um, added in several different um, musical instruments to our design. Um, we could probably skip the, um, the link at the bottom, but if you guys want to watch it later, it gives you a really great, I don't know if the sound will come over <laughs> on this um, Zoom session, but um, next slide. Um, so here's the communication board that I was referencing. Um, we have a lot of children in our school district and in our communities who don't um, are not verbal and they use augmentative communication. So they have um, communication devices that they carry around with them and um, they use that to communicate with others um, through a touch screen system. Um, where children often don't have their communication devices is outside. Um, and that's because they're on the move and it's really cumbersome to carry around a laptop or a, um, a iPad with you um, and keep, you know, you're either using your iPad with your hands or you're, um, or you're climbing, you can't do both. So this is a really cool way to incorporate um, multimodal communication into our play setting. Um, and so a lot of children would use this board as a way of making play plans and communicating where they want to be, what they want to do, what they want to do first, next. Um, I've never seen a playground that had this in it. And when I saw it, um, I think we all fell in love with the idea of having an alternative communication um, available to our children. Next slide. Um, obviously we cannot overlook the importance of shade, um, and access to table surfaces and benches, um, to offer seating, especially for caregivers, um, and for grandparents and, um, even for children as a place to rest, um, as a place to seek shade from the sun and also a place, um, to share snacks and, um, food together. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so 
we did visit um, Jessica's Boundless Playground in Belchertown, which if you haven't um, if you haven't been there, is um, an amazing playground. And we took a lot of inspiration from this playground um, when we were designing ours. And we, there were so many families coming um, from all over the place to come to this playground. It was, it's really, an, it was an attraction. Um, and <clears throat> we thought that wouldn't that be amazing for Northampton to have in this kind of a playground that was attracting um, people and to come to our area because it was offering something special um, that really isn't available um, in our in our city at this time. There is a link um, that you can also click on there um, that you don't need to click on now unless Andrea, you wanted um, to go through that. No, I, I don't think we do that. It's, that is a um, listing of accessible playgrounds in Massachusetts. And um, okay. Jessica's Boundless Playground is not even on there yet because it was created before that playground was. And, you know, we understand that funding is, is limited this round. And we are really hoping that the committee will consider um, phase one of this proposal. Um, one of the the challenges is, and I know um, Sarah had shared with Sarah some some questions about the way they pour the rubber the rubber um, footing that is really the most one of the most important things, but also one of the most expensive parts of this project because of the way it has to be poured and laid after the structure is in place. And so we can reduce the proposal somewhat, but having that ramped structure and the components in place has to happen before the footing is poured. So that makes this a little bit more challenging to be able to do it in smaller, phase, smaller phases or smaller steps. Um, but we really found it very um, telling that the only two accessible playgrounds in this area, one is in Longmeadow and one is in Belchertown. And so, um, you know, kind of two, two further ends from where we are and that Northampton can be a central location for um, children and also caregivers. And I would love to invite Samantha to um, share with us. She she works for um, Mass Brigham Cooley Dickinson Hospital and works with many community members. And um, when she found out about this proposal was really excited to uh, to talk about, you know, clients and, and the real need in this area. Samantha, do you wanna jump in? Thank you. Um, my name is Samantha Vane. I'm an occupational therapist at um, Mass General Brigham Cooley Dickinson Hospital, which is our local hospital. Um, and I do lifespan. I work in the hospital. I'm the lead therapist for the pediatric program in the main hospital. Um, I also treat um, pediatric patients in our outpatient department and uh, pretty much everybody Sarah sees. <laughs> and, um, the other piece that I do that I think is most relevant is I run the adaptive equipment clinic for Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Um, I'm the only therapist who is currently doing that. Many of us are capable of doing it, but um, it, I run a clinic weekly um, where I spend a full day helping to support all of the children and uh, caregivers and adults and people in our community who require adaptive equipment. Um, so I don't have numbers of specifically like how many referrals I get that are people from Florence specifically. Um, but we service about 300 people a year. Um, we get all types of equipment from um, manual wheelchairs, power assist wheelchairs, which is a manual wheelchair. And it has like a power assist wheel that you can take on and off to help propel further. Um, and then we also do power wheelchairs. Um, so 
one of the things that I really love about this design and how thoughtful it is, is that it also includes the caregivers. Um, and I think it's easy to feel like, oh, well, we just want to make it accessible um, for the students who would, uh, attend the school. But I think what's most attractive to the Ryan Road School District area um, from a lot of families that I work with is that it's an accessible school. Um, it's a one level school. It has an easy to get in ramp. Um, and a lot of people find that it's just a really nice little community so that their children who have mobility needs can get in and out or that they themselves can get in and out of the school to help support their children. Um, and same with grandparents who are caregivers for children or foster families who are um, caregivers for children. It's really nice to have an idea of a structure that allows a parent to be able to go with their kids who want to run around the playground and the parents can't keep up or can't get onto the mulch or, you know, can't um, get onto the structures and support their children, push their kids on a swing, which just seems to be the simplest joy of parenthood is just put your kids on a swing and push them, right? Um, and to be able to offer a structure where a caregiver can do that and not feel limited, not feel, um, whoop, sorry, um, not feel like they can't participate in these activities and shy away from an area, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm really having trouble here, um, and shy away from a uh, structure because they can't engage um, is really not great for anybody's mental health. It's not great for anyone's physical well-being, um, children included, because if their parents aren't able to mobilize, then the children have limited mobility options as well, even if they are physically able to engage in the activities that they want to engage in. Um, so I feel like there was more to be said, but um, Sarah really covered everything. I love the... Um, Oh, and the, the communication board as well. We do work with a lot of families and caregivers who require communication devices um, and having something that's right there that they don't have to lug around their device or they can kind of tuck it away because it can impede their vision as they're going around a lot of times if they have a mounted communication device on their wheelchair um, to be able to have something that they can just tuck away and be like, oh, I can use this as my catch-all for a period of time and I don't have to keep you know I can just get it out of my way and actually enjoy the space and enjoy my time here um so I think that that's a really really brilliant idea to have um, access with that as well thank you Samantha mm -hmm. um this I, I I do want as as Samantha was talking I really did think that this this is beyond your typical school playground so this isn't the idea of this project is for the entire community. This is not just for the children at Ryan Road School. This would very much so be a destination space for all children in our community and potentially, you know, surrounding towns as well. Because as Sarah said, um, the, the playground in Belchertown has children from all over that go there to play because it is the only accessible one. And so, a tr you know, a child in East Hampton or Florence or um, Holyoke, you know, would have to travel that distance to get to a playground where they could really engage and participate with peers and family members. And this would be, like I said, a, a you know, central to the Belchertown location or the Longmeadow location. Um, Northampton would offer this to all children and caregivers in the community that have mobility issues. And um, again, it is fairly timely because we are, you know, we learned that the part of the play structure has to come down soon. And um, so it, it really is the perfect opportunity to, to make some strides in the community for accessibility and inclusion. So thank you everyone for listening. And I know we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you all. Um, questions from the committee, Julia. Thank you for a really thorough presentation and kind of fun to see the 
video with the with the uh, equipment in action. Um, I have two questions. Um, uh, the first one is about accessibility. So accessibility isn't just about can I get somebody onto the playground. It's also can I get somebody to the playground. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Ryan Road is not on a. So correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to ask: Is Ryan Road on a public bus route? I'm not sure about that. Unfortunately, it is not. It's and not. It is something that we have petitioned uh, PV, PVTA for for many years. They gave us a um, a pilot trial run for I think one or two years, and then removed it. Um, it, the closest stop is at Florence Heights, which is at the end of Ryan road. Yeah. So that is, that is very much problematic and is something that I would love to continue to, uh, to rally for. Yeah. There is a bike trail that takes you from Florence Heights right. closer to the school. Right. Which, uh, was partially funded by CPC money. So we work. Well aware. Well aware. Grateful for that. Yeah. And very but grateful my second, for it. <laughs> my second question is actually about um, constructing playgrounds in the 21st century in light of climate change. So one of the issues that we look at when we look at a playground now is how do we how does everybody manage thermal regulation? And obviously what you're looking at are people who potentially have neurologic dysfunction where they have considerable problems with thermoregulation. I see a couple of shade structures, but I'm wondering if you've thought about um, the heat sensitivity and capacity of the equipment that's going on the playground, uh, the way that, that that rubber heats or doesn't heat, and and you know how this playground would be used across the, the, the warming seasons of, um, of where we live. Uh, I know that a lot of, uh, there's a lot more, so, my role on the committee is coming from Parks and Rec, and there's a lot more conversation now about how we can transform playgrounds so that they can still be played on in spite of the rise of temperatures, global rise of temperatures. So I'm not asking you to increase how much you spend on this playground, but I think I'm asking you to think about how that playground is going to be used in light of the climate that's changing. That is a really um, great point. And one of the things um, I, I think we'll keep thinking about it, but I also, um, one of the things when we had the site visit from um, Andrew from O'Brien and Sons, the uh, we were you know clear and we're lucky that around the perimeter, which isn't in the rendering that we have here, but around the perimeter of the play structure are some fairly young trees that are, really leafing out well and provide additional shade um, to, uh, along the perimeter of the playground as well. So that is one thing that I think is helpful. And also the discussion of having a um, the the lighter color rubber surface, which which helps with with heat also. Um, but there is definitely more to think about, I'm sure. I just want to add, um to that, that for the wheelchairs and um, strollers and adaptive equipment that we, that Medicare is more and Mass Health are more likely to cover canopies nowadays. Um, it is used to be an add-on that was not coverable, um, but we are able, for, especially for children who have like seizures or adults who have seizures and uh, thermogenic concerns that, you know, anything that raises their temperature could really set them off in a really bad way. Um, so it is much more coverable now, and I'm seeing a lot more. We're asking the way for pretty much everybody, and that we're coming back with more and more acceptances for those kinds of covers for families. Anything else, Julia? Martha. Thank you. Um, I have um, just a few questions. I'll try to, I know we're almost running out of time here, but um, is this, is the existing program going to get bigger with this project? Is it the same footprint? The same footprint. Yeah. Okay. We'll be staying in the footprint that currently exists. Okay. 
And the big red piece of equipment that is um, not safe anymore, is that condemned? Can it be used? Does it have to go like tomorrow or do you, can you get another couple of years out of it? Like, What's the word on that? We were, well, we were told that it was needed to come down at the end of the year. It is not condemned. Um, and that was a question that we had as well about um, as far as the timeline goes and um, as far as the ground uh, rounds of uh, funding. Um, is this something that we could wait on removing? Um, our, ki our kids are playing on it every day <laughs> right now. <laughs> so um, it is still in use. Um, and it was our um, head of maintenance that um, had determined that it needed to come down because it was uh, breaking in certain places. Um, and is it, is it plastic? Is it, is it, is it plastic or is it metal? Um, no, it's a combination of metal concrete. Um, and then there are plastic pieces on it okay. as well. Um, but we were told that the cost of rehabilitating that structure itself would be, um, just as expensive as replacing it with a new structure. It also is not accessible at all. The one that exists, both of the structures that exist there and now. Um, one has a ramp that just ends in this <laughs> nowhere space. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a dead end um, for, a, for a child that is in a wheelchair. Um, and then the whole rest of the structure is, is inaccessible. Thank you. Um, I just have two other things. Um, you mentioned that the surface um, is predicted to last about seven years. Um, is that, <laughs> can it be repaired? Is it have the entire thing have to be replaced? Um, yeah, there is a warranty on it. And, and when the warranty is up, um, often what happens with rubber surfacing is that it just wear and tear, it starts to crack in certain places that can be patched um, and can be fixed. It's not something that you would like dig up and re-pour a whole surface. You would patch um, the areas that um, started to break away. Um, and that is just something that happens over time in the same way that like, well, a lot less than wood chips. You basically have to refill every year. Um, those pack down and need to have new deliveries every one to two years um, of wood chips. So um, this is far less and, it, and the process is less involved. Okay, and then finally, um, do you have an idea of how other playgrounds at schools in the city are financed? I know we have, we the Community Preservation Committee and the CPA and the City Council have uh, funded some, um, what about the others? How does that happen typically? Are you asking about other playgrounds in the school district or in yeah. the city? Uh, um, in the school district. Yeah, because I know that like the um, uh, Jefferson Heights has one that we've supported and yeah, or Hampshire Heights, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. I don't think other playgrounds have been replaced in the no. recent, I, so, I think they're all pretty old is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Our street playground um, was re um, like parts of it were rehabilitated and they had added a big, huge open space of poured rubber. Um, I no, I can't remember what they used as a funding source. I believe um, the CPA also, yeah, said. but um, both Bridge Street and Jackson Street used uh, CPA funds in part. Yeah. yeah, I know Jackson Street was the most, I think the more recent, um, they in, they went through CPA. Um, our Leeds playground, um, I don't have a memory of how that was built, but it's in pretty good shape, the one down below. It's not accessible, <laughs> but, but um, a lot of our playgrounds were built without accessibility or inclusivity in mind. Um, it's kind of uh, startling <laughs> when you 
um, are on playgrounds with children that have differing needs um, to see how many barriers there are in all of our school playgrounds. Um, it's a daily struggle. So yeah. um, it's a it's a big issue. And um, we felt like this was was a really important place to start. Um, okay, great, thanks. Let me. Thanks. Yeah, this is such a great proposal um, or just great presentation. And I guess I'm sort of curious, um, and this is just like sort of anecdotal, but I've, I work as a social worker for, for young people in the area. And my understanding is like a lot of kids with IEPs are at Leeds Elementary. And so like, just curious about like the choice at Ryan Road, like, is it just because this play structure is coming down? Like, you know, I don't know. And maybe I'm wrong, or maybe the types of IEPs at Lee's Elementary, you know, there are kids with IEPs at every school, but um, I'm just sort of curious about like that kind of tidbit of knowledge that I happen to have. And yeah, um, just like, into, when we, um, our elementary schools became an inclusion model, all four of our schools. And um, we dismantled all of the substantially separate programming um, that was occurring. And we um, made inclusive programs. So that means that um, we, we currently have children at all four of our schools that have, um, that use wheelchairs, that have walkers, um, that have low vision, that have hearing impairments, that have autism, that have um, global um, needs, intellectual disabilities. Our children are everywhere now, which um, is amazing for inclusion. Um, but it does present the problem of having now four schools that we need to address um, access issues. And um, our IEPs are, I would say, evenly, I don't have the numbers for that, but they're well um, spread out amongst all four of our elementary schools. Um, I would not say that Leeds has more students. I wouldn't say that any of our school has more students um, with more needs. That was one of the, um, the key components of having children stay in their home schools um, and not having to leave their home community schools um, as one of the driving forces of our inclusion programs. Um, the preschool playground at Leeds has its own problems and I wouldn't be surprised if that is next on the on the list of CPA um, requests from a committee. Um, our history at Ryan Road, we did have that when we did have substantially separate programming, um, it was home to students that had intellectual disabilities and global um, developmental needs. So a lot of students with physical disabilities were at our Ryan Road School. Like I said, now children are spread out at their home schools, but um, the reason that it was put at Ryan Road is because it, it is a, a one level school. So access within the school building is fantastic. Um, and outside um, needs, a lot of, needs a lot of help. <laughs> And I, I do think that there is some talk in the district about um, the potential of moving students that have severe mobility issues to Ryan Road um, for that reason, because the the inside of the school is completely accessible um, as it, for inclusion reasons. You know, a student in a wheelchair wouldn't have to leave their class to go to the elevator when the class is going to the cafeteria or to the gym, they could just stay with their class in the line and move together. Um, so I know that there is some talks about that. And I think having a fully accessible playground could potentially help with that as well. Great. Any other questions from the committee? All right. Well then, uh, Sarah and Andrea and Samantha, thank you for coming in. Um, just one more reminder, our next meeting, April 3rd, is for public comment. So if um, you have anybody you'd like to bring in uh, to share their thoughts on this project, uh, we invite you to do so. And of course, you're welcome. Um, as a practical matter, we usually hold 
deliberations until after that meeting. I suspect this year won't be any different, uh, which means we'll be deliberating um, uh, uh, funding recommendations uh, the following meeting, which will be the 17th of April. Um, I think that concludes that portion of the the, the uh, agenda. And again, everybody who came in uh, to support uh, their proposals, we appreciate your time and your energy, um, not just tonight, but on all the work that you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. Other business not foreseen when agenda was published. Do we have any other business? I don't have any other business. Anybody got, Sarah, you got anything? No? Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, we will be meeting again on the third, uh, for public comment. Um, and then two weeks, probably two weeks after that, we'll be doing deliberations and recommendations. Um, Sarah, you, um, you mentioned an email to me about, um, bonding scenarios. Yeah, that, that's probably the, the last thing I have. So I, uh, I held off on reaching out to bond council to put together potential bonding scenarios because those are done you know, based on the projected needs that the committee might have. Right. So there, nothing's binding, but if you wanted me to reach out to bond council for what projected payments for um, potentially Memorial Hall would be the most likely one would look like. You're, give me an amount and I'll, I can do the rest. Do we know definitively because I know it was at some point it was up in the air and maybe I, I don't remember. Did we know definitively whether or not um, Ryan road would qualify for bonding? It's, given what we heard tonight about the, the limited life of the surfaces, I'm going to guess that that would not be a, a great bonding um, project, but I can double check on that. I uh, I think, I think any, any and all options right now are probably welcome. So we could find out about that. That'd be great. Sure. Um, any other comments from any of uh, other committee members before we move on? No? Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. Anybody? So moved. And second and uh, right. See everybody on uh, the third. <laughs>